Welcome Lebanon Baptist Church to another Sunday broadcast. Uh, just so you know, we very much miss you. Uh, look forward to the day, which hopefully will come in the near future when I will not be having to look at a camera, but be able to look at your smiling faces. Uh, trust that'll be uh, sooner uh, rather than later. Uh, of course, would love your prayers in reference to uh, our leadership as we seek to come up with the uh, the best plan and kind of finalize that plan and pass it on to you of how we will resume our uh, gatherings together. So please be in prayer for us in reference to that. Today I want to begin by giving you a few announcements in reference to our church. Uh, first of all, a reminder of our Zoom gathering, uh, which will take place once again uh, this Wednesday night at 7. Trust you'll join us for that. Also uh, want to let you know that we have a uh, postponed our graduate cookout and recognition as well as our backyard bible clubs uh, one of those events was supposed to happen in the middle of may and the other one was going to happen right at the beginning of june however we have kind of postponed the, both of those events till later in the summer you'll be hearing more about that in the days ahead also wanted to let you know that uh we are going to move forward on our summer of service projects uh, what this is, is an opportunity where individual members or sometimes uh, growth groups can organize a, a project to reach the community or to serve the community. And uh, what we'll have to do this summer is keep in mind uh, whatever restrictions may still be in play. But if you are an individual member and would have an idea in which you would like to maybe gather a few other people from our congregation to uh, serve the community in some particular way. Of course, last year we had areas of uh, serving uh, our, our seniors. Uh, we had a, uh, a nursing home visitation. We had a, one project in which uh, people did or uh, helped uh, write on certain bags to give to the needy. Uh, we had a car wash. This particular summer, I'm hoping to do something even in my neighborhood and try to get some of you to help in doing kind of a lake cleanup. But if you happen to have an idea uh, to serve the community and you'd like to maybe get a few other people from Lebanon to serve in that way, uh, we would love to hear about that idea. Uh, we are going to give you Pastor Josh's email and if you wouldn't mind emailing him and sharing with him uh, uh, the idea and possibly how you could help with that, uh, we would love to engage you in that particular area of service. And uh, trust over the month of June and July, we will have numbers of ways, uh, particularly thinking about uh, really the sensitivity of our community at this time, uh, ways to uh, get involved in their lives and be pictures of Christ. So if you're interested, please email Pastor Josh. Uh, before we do some singing, I'd like to open up our service with a word of prayer. So would you join me? Dear Father, we know that you are everywhere. And we know that that means that you are even present with us right there in our own homes as we uh, come together before you today. Lord, we also acknowledge the fact that we are broken people. We are people that have sinned. We are people that so often live in pride and live independently of you. Uh, we would admit as well that none of us have handled this quarantine exactly the way that we should have. And no doubt we come to you again this morning seeking to confess before you our, uh, our sins our frailty, and we come to you uh, seeking your mercy and help and guidance. And particularly today as we gather together and sing, as we gather together to pray and to hear from your word, I ask that you would indeed be present with us. Lord, may we sense that presence. Lord, we thank you for the gospel uh, in which you understood uh, life in a broken world. In fact, your son experienced it. He endured it, but uh, also he lay, laid out for us a path to follow him. And uh, we thank you for that path of restoration that you have given to us. And so today, 
we come to you and begin this service by asking that you would indeed use this pandemic time, this quarantine time, uh, that you would use it in our lives to build us up rather than tear us down. We do ask that you would allow it to subside quickly, that you uh, would allow our church to be able to regather together and to be able to practice those uh, one another's in a more significant manner. But today, Father, as we uh, in many ways gather around your word, I ask that you would uh, help us to have more guidance from your word that you would allow it to be a lamp unto our, our feet and a light unto our path, and that you would open it up uh, so that we would be people who hear it and that would put it into practice. Guide this entire service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a few songs that we will sing together. Nothing can 
Today for our scripture reading, I'd like to invite you uh, to turn in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1. Uh, as I mentioned to you last week, uh, we kind of uh, began a series on the minor prophets. Uh, I told you that uh, before this whole quarantine began, uh, Pastor Scott was planning to uh, take a few weeks to open up the book of Jonah before our congregation, but uh then, of course, all of this began, and we uh, had a few different messages on various topics. I decided to uh, open up the book of Habakkuk to you. And now, uh, beginning this week, uh, Pastor Scott is going to be uh, teaching us, and preaching to us from the book of Jonah. And so in just a moment, I'm going to read that particular chapter. As uh, you are turning there, I want to also thank you for your faithfulness and your online giving. Many of you have sent checks in. Just to kind of give you a report, I know at the end of uh, March, uh, we were over budget when it came to giving, and I just want to thank you for your faithfulness and reference to that. The Lord has strategically uh, set us up to be able to continue to minister uh, during this particular time, and uh, I ask that you'd continue in your faithfulness there. And I uh, just want to thank him, the Lord as well, for uh, taking care of us during this time. And thank you for your faithfulness. Let me read to you from Jonah chapter 1. You uh, follow along as I read. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. For their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, And the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up. And hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to the dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah 
and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Would you join me as I lead us in our corporate prayer for today? Dear Father, as we consider this passage right in front of us, Lord, we are reminded of your character. You are a God who is just, one who, uh, whose eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good. And Father, you do punish sin as you were preparing to do there in Nineveh. Or we know as well that you are a merciful God. And it's for that very reason that you raised up Jonah. And you called him to this task. We also, Father, want to thank you for your sovereignty that we are reminded of. You are in charge of every piece of weather. You are in charge of everything that happens. You are in charge of every animal. Father, you are sovereign over all. Lord, we once again confess to you that we are people in many ways like Jonah that run from your face. Lord, our own sin, our own selfishness, our own pride so often separates us from communion with you. Lord, no doubt there are people within Lebanon Baptist Church, Father, that right now have run from you. They're afraid to talk to you. And Lord, I ask that they would join me even today as I pray and confess before you their own sin. Lord, forgive me, forgive our congregation of so often uh, giving in to the allurements of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Lord, forgive us of those. Lord, we know that your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And although we spend so much time running away from you, it is just in a moment that we can be uh, renewed by your grace. Lord, just like uh, David was many years ago when he confessed to you and he asked for you to restore unto him the joy of of his salvation. Father, we ask that you would restore to us, even in the midst of this quarantine time, restore to us the joy of our salvation. And Father, would you help all of us to run to you rather than away from you? Lord, we thank you for your pursuing us in your grace. We thank you that you, uh, your son provided everything we needed in the gospel to bring us to a place where we can walk with you on a daily basis. And Father, would your grace continue to teach us how we can live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And help us to be those who indeed wait for your appearing, that we would long for it and yearn for it. Father, I come to you now and I ask that if once again, any of us did not join me in praying that prayer of returning to you. If any of our congregation has run from you, that, Father, would you lovingly pursue them. And that you would, when we gather together again, even corporately, would you allow all of our church to be found walking faithfully with you. Lord, I ask that the ones who have special needs right now, those who are dealing with physical trials, I ask that you would lift them up. I ask that in the midst of their pain, that they would cry to you and they would find peace and, and hope and comfort. Lord, I ask for our church right now, those in our congregation who are now financially needy, Lord, would you, uh, first of all, would you make it known to others within our congregation through just our conversations that we would 
find these things out and learn how to minister to one another. Father, if there is anyone right now who feels lonely, maybe in some ways they have fallen through the cracks in reference to no one in the church has maybe contacted them and they feel lonely. Lord, I ask that you would fill that void and that they would not be filled with selfishness, but that they would take that and would they seek out somebody else within our body and seek to minister and love and invest. Rather than looking internally, may they look up and look externally. And Father, would they find hope and grace and love through ministry to others. Lord, I ask that you would help Pastor Scott as he now opens the scriptures before us. I ask that you would give him clear insight and strength. And Father, would you allow your word to uh, soak into our life through this service? And would we be people that respond rightly to it uh, at the end? And may this whole entire week we be people who allow your word to be what dominates our thinking. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Lebanon Baptist Church. I'm excited to be able to open the word together with you this morning. And as Brian mentioned last week, we're going to dive into the book of Jonah this week. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn to that Old Testament book of Jonah, and we'll begin uh, just a brief series on this little book over the next couple of weeks. I'll have to say that Jonah is probably one of the most popular Bible stories that is out there. Unfortunately, I think it's one of the most misunderstood, misinterpreted, and misapplied Bible stories as well. When you come to the book of Jonah, there's a lot of things within it that uh, causes people within our modern day and age to question if the events of this book are even real. Some people, even those that would believe the Bible, would want to interpret Jonah as an allegory or a parable, um, some sort of symbolic thing, not so much historical and not so much literal. But I believe that the events of this book do actually describe real history, real people, and real events for a couple of different reasons. One, we know that Jonah, the son of Amittai, as we see in verse 1, lived and prophesied in Israel in the 8th century BC. So he was a real historical figure. Secondly, if you believe Genesis 1.1, then the events of this book are well within God's skill set. And then I would also say that when you get to the New Testament, Jesus refers to the book of Jonah. He refers to the person of Jonah. He refers to Nineveh and all the events of this book as historical, not allegory or parable. And I tend not to argue with people who resurrect from the grave. So for all that, I really do believe that what we're going to look at is real historical, literal events. Now, before we jump in, I want to see some of the history and some of the background to this book. Verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, the people of Israel would know exactly who this is. Jonah, the son of Amittai, to the northern kingdom, may have been some sort of national hero for a while. As many of you know, um, after the reign of Solomon, civil war broke out, and Israel was divided into the northern kingdom of uh, Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And for years, the northern kingdom had trembled at the name Assyria. Now, Assyria was a great threat to the northern kingdom. They held great influence over Israel and her kings, and many of the kings were actually forced to pay tribute to Assyria. And over time, um, Israel began to lose land, their borders began to shrink, and the military capital of Assyria was none other than Nineveh. Now, Jonah prophesied 
in the 8th century BC, about 150 years after King Solomon, and it was during the reign of King Jeroboam II. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 14 so we can get a little bit of the historical background on this guy Jonah and the nation of Israel at this time. 2 Kings chapter 14, and we'll read beginning in verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Okay, so what we know is that Jeroboam II was not a good king, but what we also know is that Israel, the northern kingdom at this time, was not a good nation either. It was a time of oppression. It was a time of greed. It was a time of injustice. Religious hypocrisy was running rampant. In fact, if you want to know what God thought about this and what he thought about Israel at this time, you can read the books of Hosea and Amos. They were sort of contemporaries with Jonah. And what we know is that Israel was truly deserving of God's judgment. But I want you to notice what happened, verse 25. He restored, talking about Jeroboam, he restored the border of Israel from Lebohamoth as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from gath Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, so he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now, this is really good news for the northern kingdom. Because the borders now are being pushed back. They're expanding back to where King Solomon had originally established them. So what we see here is that God is actually blessing them. But not because of their king. Not because of the people. But verse 26, because the Lord had compassion on them. And I want you to notice who the vehicle of this blessing was. It was Jonah, the son of Amittai. He was a messenger of God's kindness and God's blessing to his nation, delivering a message of great mercy even to those who were most undeserving. So that gives us kind of the history and the background of this book. But let's ask this question, what is the purpose of this book? Why the book of Jonah? Well, we know this, Jonah was a prophet. Now, prophets in the Old Testament didn't just simply predict the future, although they did some of that. But what prophets were, they acted sort of like, you could say, prosecuting attorneys for God. They would argue God's case against Israel, and they were called to keep the word of the Lord in front of the people, warning them of sin warning them of their idolatry, calling them to come back to the Lord. But on the surface, when you read through the book of Jonah, it doesn't really seem to fit into that. But when you look at it a little bit deeper, you'll see this. Because what this is, is this book is not just a unique story in the Old Testament. But it is, in fact, a prophetic book. It's a book of prophecy to the nation of Israel, but not In what Jonah says, it's a prophecy to the nation in who Jonah is and what Jonah does. So I want you to see that the book of Jonah actually has the same purpose as all the other prophets, designed by God to grab the attention of Israel by setting Jonah up as sort of like a representative of the whole nation. And through Jonah, what God is doing is he is exposing Israel's self-righteousness, their hypocrisy. He's exposing their nationalistic arrogance that they had embraced. 
And through it all, he is revealing his heart of mercy and his heart of compassion and his desire to forgive those that would turn to him. So here's the main point that I want you to get this morning. If you, if you want to write this down, uh, if you're taking notes, this might help you get uh, sort of a summary of what we're going to see this morning in chapter 1. And here's the main point. That in his love, God will expose our deepest need. In his grace, he will pursue us when we run. In his mercy, he will bring us back to himself. In his love, God will expose our deepest need. In his grace, he will pursue us even when we run. And in his mercy, he will bring us back to himself. So let's look at Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Arise. The word is really just, he could have said, up, get up, stop what you're doing, and go. Verse 3, but Jonah arose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So, so now, now God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. That's about 500 miles northeast of where Jonah was. Uh, it's in modern day Iraq, just outside of the city of Mosul. Tarshish, we think, is about 2,500 miles west of where Jonah was on the southern tip of Spain. So there's a huge spread in where he is told to go and where he wants to go. And it says that he ran from the presence of the Lord. Literally, it's saying he ran from the face of God. What this is, is, is kind of a way of saying Jonah is looking at God saying, I refuse to be a part of what you're doing. In a sense, Jonah's turning in his prophet card and he's saying, I'm out, I'm done. So he runs down to Joppa. It's a seaport on the Mediterranean. He finds a boat that's heading to Tarshish and he hits the open seas. Now, right as we get into this, we have to ask, why did Jonah run? Why did he not arise and go to Nineveh? Well, honestly, it really wasn't a safe mission. It wasn't a convenient mission. Remember, Nineveh was the military capital of Assyria, great enemies of the northern kingdom. And God described this as a great city whose evil had come up before him. In other words, their wickedness was in his face and it could not go unchecked any longer. Now, I'm not going to go into the gory details of it all, but what we know from history about the tactics of the Assyrian Empire would make ISIS blush. They, they were horrific. Uh, they were brutal. They were grotesque in their torture. You, you could say that Nineveh was the ancient terrorist state. So imagine a Jewish prophet going to an Assyrian army base, walking up to the gates, knocking on the door saying, excuse me, I'm a prophet of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and I have a message of judgment that I'd like to share with you. Would you be okay with that? You know, that, that would not be too safe. That would not be very convenient. Well, that may be part of it. But we actually get the real answer, and the real answer is given to us when we get to chapter 4. So here's a spoiler alert. If you're not familiar with the story of Jonah, uh, we do need to address this as we get into it at the beginning here. Jonah did go, eventually, and he did preach to Nineveh, and Nineveh repented of their evil ways, and God withheld his judgment. And Jonah actually tells God that's why he ran in the first place. Because he didn't want God to show mercy to Nineveh. Now I want you to let that sink in. A prophet of God's mercy and blessing to his own people. People living in open rebellion to God. Didn't think Nineveh deserved that same mercy and blessing. I mean, here's Jonah. It's like, I mean, Israel is God's chosen people. They're God's loved people. Sure, I can understand mercy and blessing there, but Nineveh? I mean, that's a wicked group of people. Their evil was in the face of the Lord, not those people. Now, 
Some of you may say, but didn't God tell Jonah to go and pronounce judgment, to cry against it? Yes. Here's the thing. Anytime God pronounces judgment, it comes from a heart of mercy. In fact, Jeremiah addresses this in Jeremiah 18 and verses 7 and 8. God says, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. See, God is holy, God is just, and God must always judge sin. But the heart of God is this, that in the proclamation of that just judgment on sin, his desire is that it would stir in the heart of those that hear it a heart of repentance. So that God, in what he says he would do in judging sin, will end up not doing because he's a God of great mercy. And Jonah knows enough about his God to realize what God is up to. And Jonah says, I'm out. I'm not going where you're going, God. Now, I, th I think at this point we need to really put ourselves in Jonah's sandals. <laughs> if you were a people group and there was another people group that was a significant threat to your own nation, and God says, I want to show them mercy. But I want you to be the one to tell them. How would you feel? Now, all of you godly people, you're saying, I just would love to see so many people saved and experience the mercy of God. My thought would be, you know, wait just a minute here. I'm really good with this idea of you blessing my nation and my people, but them? I mean, after the atrocities that they've committed, they deserve to be judged. But God is gracious. He's merciful, he's slow to anger, and he's abounding in steadfast love. And his desire is to use us, his people, to deliver the message that God is holy, that he must judge sin, but he is a God of great mercy. But Jonah was going to have none of that. God, they deserve to be judged. So why should we go and do an uncomfortable thing like that? I mean, what if they end up coming to our church? What if they join my class? What if they start attending my small group? Well, they're not church-going people. Just think of the issues that that might cause. Do you see how easy we can take the gift of God's mercy to us and then act as a gatekeeper to determine who is or who isn't qualified? Lebanon Baptist Church, could our community observe us and conclude that this is how we think? That we only reach out to those who are like us or those that do like us. We evaluate who would and who would not make a good Christian. And we just, together amongst ourselves, we complain about how bad this world is and we're just thankful that we're not like them. Have we allowed prejudice um, thoughts to creep into our own hearts? Have we even allowed a sense of nationalistic pride to impact how indiscriminately we love all kinds of people? This is where Jonah was. And so when God says go, Jonah says no, and he runs. But if you're a child of God, what you know is this. Running from God is a very futile task. So sometime after Jonah hops on the boat and the boat gets out into the open sea, verse 4, we find out that the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest upon the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Now this is no ordinary storm. It's so violent that the ship is close to breaking Verse 5, you have these experienced sailors that are fearing for their life. They all start crying out to their gods. And in the polytheism of the day, they had different gods for different locations, kind of like cell towers. And they're just trying to connect with the right god. And it seems like no service is available. 
And so they start tossing cargo over the side of the ship to try to lighten the load. So you can just picture the mayhem that's on this, uh, on the deck of the ship here. Sailors are praying, they're screaming, they're scrambling, they're throwing things. But ironically, verse 5, it tells us that Jonah had gone down in the inner part of the ship and lain down and he was fast asleep. He's taking a nap. He's out cold. And then the captain finds him in verse 6 and he says, what do you mean, you sleeper? Like, how can you sleep in a time like this? Now, what I want you to note is as you read through the book of Jonah, the book is full of satire. It's full of irony. It's full of uh, play on words. And there's some kind of Hebrew humor thrown in throughout this book. So here it is. Picture this. Here, as Jonah is in that zone between sleep and wake, notice what he hears. Arise, call out to your God. (laughs) The exact same word he heard earlier when God says, arise and go to Nineveh. So here's Jonah. It's like, wait a minute, isn't this what got this whole thing started? Arise. No. Now he's being called to arise and call on his God. And, And it's like Jonah is going, of all the things that you could ask, I'm not talking to God right now. In fact, I'm I've unfollowed him. I'm I am running from him. But the captain pushes him and he says, if you could just get through to your God, maybe we won't die. But it doesn't even appear like Jonah responds to him. Verse 7, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. They, They know that there is something out of the ordinary about this storm. Something supernatural. And so they decide to, in many ways, roll the dice to figure out who is at fault. And wouldn't you know it, the dice land on Jonah. And when it does, the sailors go nuts. Look at verse (laughs) 8. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account is this evil has come upon us. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you? And they start grilling him. And uh, what does Jonah say? Jonah says, verse 9, he says, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, get this, who made the sea and the dry land. (laughs) And and when the sailors hear that, verse 10, they, they say, the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? In other words, they're looking at him, they're like, what in the world are you thinking? If your God is powerful enough to do this, and he's the one who created the sea, Why in the world did you choose the sea to run from him? And why did you have to choose our ship? Who is this idiot? (laughs) Verse 11, then they said to him, what are we going to do so that the sea would quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. Okay. Uh, So here's Jonah saying, you know, we're all going to be better off if you just throw me overboard and let me die. Now look at verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. Now isn't this interesting? How merciful of these outsiders to this Israelite. They don't want him to die. They try as hard as they can to get back to safety. But it doesn't seem like it works because the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. So they conclude that Jonah's idea was the only option. Verse 14, therefore, they called out to the Lord, Yahweh, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not on us innocent blood for you, Lord, has done, you've done as you have pleased. And so they pick up Jonah and they throw him overboard. And suddenly, unnaturally, the storm shuts off. And no longer are these sailors terrified of the storm. Verse 16, they stand in awe of Yahweh. And they offer sacrifices and make vows. Now, there has been a lot of discussion on whether or not these guys were converted 
Did they become real followers of Jehovah, the God of Israel? Or did they just happen to add Yahweh to their list of other gods? Well, the text really doesn't say. Because that's not the issue. So don't get hung up on whether or not these sailors were saved or not. That's not the focus. It's not the point of the text. Remember, zoom out a little bit. Jonah is like a microcosm of the nation of Israel. Israel is called out of the nations in order to be a witness to the nations of Jehovah, declaring to them the wonders of the one true and living God. So God chose Israel not for the sake of Israel, but so that through them all the nations of the world could be blessed. But instead, they developed a sense of ethnic superiority nationalistic pride, prejudice toward outsiders. All the while, they embraced religious hypocrisy and idolatry. And over and over and over again, God sent his prophets to the nation and to the kings, and he was calling them to respond to the word of the Lord, to repent. But continually, The nation stiff-armed God and his prophets, and they rejected the word of the Lord. All of that is encapsulated in Jonah, a prophet of the Lord. He is supposed to be calling people to respond to God, and in sort of a humorous irony here, the writer reveals to us how everything is responding to God, except the very one that you think would be. Look back at verse 4. Notice how it says that the Lord hurled a great wind and there was a mighty tempest that rose up, right? So the weather is responding to God. Verse 4, it tells us that the ship threatened to break up. This is in the Hebrew, it's, it, the ship is being personified and it's almost like the ship is, is saying, it, it, the ship is seriously considering breaking up, right? Like, it's like the boat is talking, going, are you kidding me? I wasn't built for this kind of a storm. So the ship is responding. And the very thing that Jonah was trying to avoid, telling outsiders about Jehovah, it's exactly what he ends up doing. And when these sailors hear about Yahweh, the sailors even respond to God. See what the writer is doing is taking our expectations and turning them completely upside down. Notice, who is praying? Who's really bothered? by Jonah's disobedience? Who's showing compassion to the outsider? Who is growing in their fear of Yahweh? Everything and everyone is alert to what God is doing, but in contrast, the one that has been called to arise in obedience to God The author uses this word over and over again to draw attention that Jonah, instead of arising to obey, went down to Joppa, down to the boat, down into the ship. He lay down and he's asleep, completely unresponsive to God and what he's doing. Now, do you see the point? And do you see how this is a case against Israel? Not in what Jonah says, but in who he is and what he does. The ones that should be listening and responding to God are not. So here's the question. What's God doing in all of this? I mean, if he really wanted to show mercy to Nineveh, Why not just get another prophet? I mean, Hosea, man, he could have communicated this message really, really effectively. Amos, man, he could have preached up a storm. Why would God choose a guy like Jonah? Why would he ask a guy that he knew was a self-righteous, nationalistic, racist bigot? Well, here's the reality. God called Jonah to this mission precisely because that's what Jonah was. He knew Jonah's heart. And what God was doing for Jonah 
and ultimately for the nation of Israel, was revealing to them that although they appeared religious and they talked religious and they did all the religious things, that didn't mean everything was well. This was a nation of whom God would say, this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. In other words, their worship is just an issue of doing this and doing that, checking off the list, thinking they're okay. I mean, even Jonah here. Jonah tells the sailors, I fear the Lord. But there was no true fear of God. To Jonah, the fear of God was just an issue of, I belong to Jehovah's people, so therefore I'm good, and I do all the Jehovah things. So what God does here is he takes one of his own prophets, he sets him up as an example, and he says, in love... I'm going to have you do something that will expose the deepest need of your heart so that I can do a work to deeply change you. Now, I want you to think about that. How loving of God would it have been to allow Jonah to continue on in his nationalistic pride, his religious hypocrisy, and his own self-righteousness, thinking, hey, I'm an Israelite, I'm a prophet, I'm good. But never actually really knowing God's mercy in a way that deeply humbled him, transformed him, and gave him truly a fear of Jehovah from the heart. So God, in his love, seeks to expose the rampant self-righteousness not only in Jonah but his people. And by putting the tea bag into the hot water, so to speak, what's inside starts to come out. Now, how does this hit us today? Well, when our self-righteousness gets exposed for what it really is, we're going to do one of two things. If our self-righteousness gets exposed, we'll either recognize it and repent of it and allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to come and do a transforming work of grace in our heart. Or we'll do what Jonah did. We'll ignore it. We'll deny it. We'll run and try to get away from the real work that God wants to do in our hearts. But I want you to notice that this, though, is actually good news. It's good news in that God wants to set us free from that bondage. He wants to open our eyes so that we're not living in self-deception anymore. Because every single one of us, we are bent towards self-righteousness. Just like Jonah, just like the nation of Israel, we so easily congratulate ourselves because we We say the Jesus words, we sing the Jesus songs, and we like and we follow and we share all the Jesus stuff and we observe and do all the Jesus thing. And and on the surface, everything looks pretty good. We're good people, we're religiously devoted, we're fine, upstanding, conservative citizens. But here's the thing, we all have a tendency to build our identity on the things that we're self-righteous about. Like the Pharisee, who said, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. But we refuse to get really honest about the real issues of our heart. And in a subtle but very twisted way, we actually start to congratulate ourselves for being objects of God's grace. And then we draw near with our mouth and honor him with our lips, but deep down, things aren't right. For Jonah and his nation, their self-righteousness led them to build their security and their identity in the fact that they were Hebrews, children of Abraham, 
doing all of the Jehovah things without ever truly embracing and imaging the heart of Jehovah for the sake of this world. So, could God have called another prophet to go do this? Sure. But there's a lot more going on here than that. God is not only seeking to extend mercy to Nineveh, he's wanting to do a deep work in the heart of Jonah and in the nation of Israel as a whole. He's exposing their hypocrisy. He's exposing their idolatry. He's warning them of the danger of it. And he's revealing to them that he is, in fact, a God of great mercy. And that he will show mercy not only to wicked nations like Nineveh and self-righteous people like Nineveh, but unloving prophets like Jonah. So, here's Jonah. He's swimming, floating and starting to sink in the middle of the Mediterranean. And verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, here is where a lot of skeptics get out of the boat. Or you have people trying to figure out, was this a shark? Was it a whale? Is it possible for a man to live inside of a whale? Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write this down, okay? It's not about the fish, okay? <laughs> get that. It's not about the fish. In fact, I think it's kind of humorous because if you read through the whole story and you get to chapter 4, um, there are five verses devoted to the plant that grew up. But in this, there's two verses devoted to the fish. So why, do, why don't we make Bible story books about Jonah and the plant? Why don't we make a big deal of that? It's so much bigger than the plant. It's so much bigger than the fish. So don't get hung up on that. Here's the question you need to ask. What happens to Jonah if God does nothing? Answer. He's going to die. So in all of this, what must capture our attention and our affections is not the storm. It's not the sailors making sacrifices. It's not even the fish. What ought to capture our attention is the mercy of God. This isn't some sort of karma where God is getting Jonah back. You know, this, this is a, a vivid reminder that no matter what, God is not going to give up on his people. He wants to do a deep work in your heart and in my heart so that we would be all that God created us and saved us to be. So the Lord hurled a great wind not to punish Jonah, but to wake him up. The Lord appointed a great fish not to pay Jonah back for his sins, but to bring Jonah back from his sin. And even when Jonah turned and ran from the face of the Lord, God did not let him go. Even when Israel repeatedly stopped their ears to the message of the prophets, God continued to pursue them. And if you are truly a child of God today, God will not give up on you. Because God is committed to working out his plan in your life. And he who began a good work in you, he will complete it. No matter how he has to go about it. So where are you? Has God recently revealed anything about the reality of your heart that made you really uncomfortable? Has God exposed any self-righteousness in your heart? Maybe it was in a sermon recently. Maybe it was in your own personal Bible reading. Maybe it was a parent that addressed something. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was during a small group discussion. Maybe it was through a circumstance that God used a situation to expose something about your heart. How did you respond? How are you responding? Are you humbly owning it and seeking for God's grace to deeply transform you? Or are you making excuses? Are you denying it, avoiding it, 
ignoring, blame shifting, even running from what God is wanting to do in your heart? Remember this, in his love, God will expose our deepest need. In his grace, he will pursue us when we run. And in his mercy, he will bring us back to himself. And next week, as we get into chapter 2, we'll see the severe mercy of God trying to bring Jonah back to himself. May we allow the love and the grace and the mercy of God to work deeply in all of us. Let's pray. God, I thank you for giving us the record here of the story of Jonah. And Father, we do confess that we are a lot more like Jonah. We're a lot more like the nation of Israel than we want to admit. And so I want to thank you that you are so committed to making us more like Jesus that you're going to do an uncomfortable work in our hearts at times. But thank you for the reality that Jesus has died and rose again to free us from our own sin and even our own self-righteousness. Thank you that as your children, we have your spirit to enable us to live for you. So God, I pray that you will take these truths, give us the grace to listen, the grace to respond, the grace to repent in ways that need to be done. And Lord, we ask that you would change us for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.